Hello and welcome to the channel. Today we have a very special video thanks to our guest William from St. Gallen who very kindly loaned us his Army Stunger 57. This particular one has been Arsenal refurbished roughly in the 70s probably and has been assembled in 1965. Um, the video is going to be pretty straightforward. Uh, I'm going to be taking the rifle apart as far as possible without actually disturbing any of the riveted fits. Um, however, I'm still going to show you the individual parts just to give you an idea of how this rifle is constructed. Uh, we have most of the tools available right here, so um, let's get right to it. We're going to break the rifle down into its main groups for disassembly. Uh, to actually start executing this, I'm going to remove the stock assembly. On the bottom of the stock tube, you have a stock catch. By simply pressing it in and twisting the stock counterclockwise, I could remove it pretty easily. Just gonna unhook the sling on that. And out it comes. For bolt removal, withdraw charging handle, remove it. Out comes your bolt group. For the trigger housing, you have this semi-captive push pin right here that is being held in place via these two little projections or nubs right here. So to take this out, you need to push the push button in like this. That depresses the nubs and I can remove the takedown pin altogether. Next, your jacket assembly comes out. It is held in place onto the receiver via the front trunnion on this single slotted machine screw. I'm going to use an appropriate screwdriver for the job. Sometimes the screw needs a bit of persuading with a punch. Once the screw is removed, you can carefully slide the jacket assembly off the barrel. And this is how the rifle has presented itself in its major groups. So in order to help you navigate around the video, I'm going to put timestamps in the comments that hopefully will result in chapters if the YouTube feature cooperates. Uh, we're also going to add accessories to the list of stuff that are going to be dismantled, such as the magazines, both for ball ammunition and rifle grenade cartridges, as well as disassembly of the scope catch and disassembly of the model 1957 bayonet. Now, I do want to remind you that uh, the purpose of this video is to entertain. Um, I'm not a professional gunsmith, I'm not an armor, so any practices or tools that are used in this video I would take with a grain of salt. If you do have a problem with your rifle, I would suggest consulting with a professional gunsmith, um, but please take this video as entertainment. So this right here is the barreled receiver group. Um, really the star of the show here is going to be what is called internally in SIG the receiver front section. So in fact what you really see here is not the complete receiver. The stock tube itself has a rear receiver section so to take this apart you actually have to split the rear third of the receiver. Pretty interesting. The barrel itself, which is 609 millimeters long, is firmly screwed onto the receiver front trunnion right here. The trunnion contains most of the, the parts on the receiver front section. You have the carry handle, the roller mortises on both sides, as well as a loaded chamber indicator and loaded chamber indicator spring. At the rear trunnion of the receiver front section, you have, of course, the diopter rear sight, which we're going to take apart later. And on the barrel itself, the rifle grenade tension spring. The rifle grenade annual spring lives in this groove that is machined into the barrel itself. You can see the whole spigot assembly right here, the three slip rings necessary for rifle grenade guidance, and the rear slip ring, which is for the barrel bushing on the jacket assembly. It takes two appropriately sized bits and you simply pry it off the barrel as such. So once I get this started, you can see the spring is sticking out. I can now pry it out with the help of a tool. And out it comes. Now you can see the rifle grenade annular spring right here. 
It's got this kind of horseshoe shape. Uh, the largest part of the spring is ever so slightly bigger than the internal diameter of the rifle grenade, which means that when the rifle grenade is slipped onto the spigot, the spring deforms ever so slightly. And this provides a bit of static friction in case you want to use the rifle grenade in negative angles. So a pretty well thought out feature there. Now, of course, removal of this spring is not really necessary. These don't really fail, but uh, I just want to show it to you for the heck of it, really. Barrel removal, unfortunately, is not a very straightforward process for me. It requires very heavy, specialized tooling. Basically, you have a vice block where you insert your barrel through these flats near the support flange and a, a wrench that interfaces on the front trunnion itself. Uh, now, these are torqued on relatively tight, um, so this is not something I'll be getting into this video. As for the muzzle brake assembly itself, it is integrally machined into the barrel, so realistically there's not much we can take apart in this particular aspect. Uh, there are several variants of barrels. Some of these were nitrided, some of these were blued and case hardened. I'm not going to go through it in this video, but this particular barrel seems to be uh, case hardened. These tend to have a purplish gradient in the first 100 millimeters. Basically, the breech end was requenched to harden this particular area, especially that bolt contact face to prevent deformation. In terms of markings, you generally have a subcontractor marking here, in this case, uh, Hemoli, as well as a continuous barrel serial number that doesn't match the rifle serial number, by the way. And depending on the variant of barrel, you can either get uh, a lock code for the heat treatment or a tenifer lock code for the later nitrided barrels. Let's focus now on the receiver front section trunnion, this part right here, which is basically a drop forged part that is then finished machined with the various bores and features. Uh, on it are the roller mortises. Now these are extremely important because these are basically what, de what define how much of the cartridge case impulse is being absorbed by the receiver front trunnion and therefore in proportion how much is directed towards the bolt carrier and its automation. The mortises you see here are these circular parts. Uh, these are made out of higher quality steel and very deeply case hardened, which kind of justify why these need to be separate parts because you cannot really apply the same materials and heat treatments to the entire receiver. So it's a relatively rational design choice. Basically the mortises are being held in place in the trunnion via this flange right here and that's preventing it from squirting out in your direction. And you can see what prevents them from being pushed inwards is this snap ring or circlip right here. Now you may wonder if this is a cylindrical mortise in a cylindrical recess, what's actually preventing it from rotating round and round? And this is quite clever. You can see just barely peeking out from that circlip a little recess with a imperial ball bearing. And that's what keeps it in place in this particular axis of motion. So let's get right to it on the receiver itself. I'm going to remove the circlip with uh, these pliers right here. Now, do know that there are two separate variants of these snap rings. Uh, the early versions tend to have smaller holes. The later versions have bigger holes for some reason. I think this is mostly supplier dependent. For the later snap rings, these require their own special tools just to make sure that the tool engages properly into the various holes. So let me just engage that in. Remove the snap ring in this way. And be very careful and make sure that you work over a rough, soft surface because remember that ball bearing, there's actually nothing that retains it. So when you push that mortise in, you want to make sure that ball bearing doesn't get lost. <laughs> Where the f is the bearing? <laughs> ah, I see it peeking out right there. There it is. So definitely don't do what I just did. Don't push it in very quickly like this, but there's your ball bearing and your actual mortise. I'm gonna repeat this on the other side. And there's your ball bearing with your mortise. Now the mortises on a gun are interchangeable. There's no left or right and you can probably swap them around without too much effect. Um, pretty good design in my opinion. To remove the loaded chamber indicator leaf spring, which is this part you see slightly peaking there, slightly shiny, 
I need to remove this countersunk head slotted screw right here. Now, do be very careful. Even though the slot looks very wide, uh, in reality, it actually goes over the shaft of the screw, which means that what you see on the edges there, roughly 0.5 millimeters, is the actual front trunnion. So if you take the correct, what you think is a correct uh, bit, you might actually gouge the edges of the countersink, which is a design choice I cannot explain, but that's just the nature of the beast. I'm going to use the appropriate screwdriver bit, which I remind is slightly narrower than the machine screw. Just Yeah, that's tight. This one is nice and tight. Back it off a couple turns, give it a few taps. This is to loosen the chamber indicator, which in some rifles may be frozen in place from all the carbon buildup. This one seems fine. And now comes your screw right here. The loader chamber indicator spring is basically forked onto the loader chamber indicator itself. I can simply remove it by reaching into the receiver and out it drops. There it is. To actually remove the loader chamber indicator, which is this cylindrical part right here, uh, unfortunately there's no way around it. You have to remove the barrel. The reason for that is because the loader chamber indicator has this beak-like extension right here that interfaces directly on the chamfer in the barrel on the breech end. Therefore it is basically positively retained and the only way to remove that realistically is to unscrew the barrel. Same thing goes for the carry handle. You can see basically that there's a roll pin that retains it in a, in a groove and uh, the through hole actually goes into the barrel threads as you can see right here on the cutaway model. There right here is the bore for the carry handle roll pin. So both of these parts can only be removed with the barrel off. Now, of course, there are two ways, or semi-official ways, to remove the carry handle. One is to actually pound it out by slamming it with a mallet. That breaks the roll pin, which allows you to remove the carry handle. The other way is to use a special tool called the Auszieh-Werkzeug, basically an extracting tool. Uh, basically, you have a tap that threads itself into the roll pin, akin to a corkscrew, and then you simply, in theory, pluck the roll pin out. Now in reality this tool is rarely used. Let's move on now to the diopter rear sight assembly. The rear sight assembly is basically fixed onto the receiver via the sight base with a roll pin. To get to this roll pin I need to remove the sight cursor first which has the role of indexing the drum in its various increments. To kick this off I'm going to put the drum either at the 45 degree or the flat position so I get easy access to the tiniest of snap rings that you see on the tip of my fingernail. To remove this requires a pair of pliers with extremely thin, uh, basically little piano wires there. So I'm just going to put the circlip plier into the holes. And just pry that open. It may take a few tries. and off it comes. There's your little snap ring there. Now you can see your detent is flopping around. Now to actually clear this out, you want to make sure that you move the drum to the highest position, which is 640 meters, and it should come out on its own with, of course, the cursor spring. This one looks pretty healthy, not bent. Now you can see that the actual diopter roll pin is accessible. This takes a special type of punch, basically a roll pin punch with a cylindrical shoulder here that allows me to center it nicely with the roll pin and I can start drifting it out. I'm going to use a 200 gram hammer for this operation. Roll pin is out. Now, when you remove the diopter from the sight base, be very careful. You have a spring detent that actually indexes in the, in the folded and unfolded position. You want to make sure you put your fingers over this area to avoid them squirting out when you remove the diopter rear sight. So I'm just going to pry this loose, just like this, and you can see, just peeking out of the hole there, the detent. 
just going to push this out with a punch. And you can see here the D10 assembly. Basically, it's two spring cups and a D10 spring. Now the diopter is off. The side base itself is firmly brazed and welded onto the receiver itself. So there's not much to take apart here. The diopter rear side itself was not really designed to be taken apart and serviced even by armors. This is designed to be a pre-packaged, pre-assembled, fully integrated and sealed assembly. Uh, however, there is one thing that the armor could actually remove is the aperture insert, which is actually a separate threaded part in the aperture plate. Now for this, all it takes is a simple slotted screwdriver bit. I can actually take this out and just remove the aperture insert by unscrewing it. And out it comes, you can see this right here. In case they have little nicks, dents and gouges that might uh, affect your sight picture, it could be easily replaced. Pretty well thought out design. Now a lot of aftermarket sites actually use the original thread. You know, if you want to have irises or filters or whatnot, that's also a possibility. What I'm going to do next is uh, really not recommended at all and has to be taken for entertainment value. The diopter here is really a very intricate assembly. If you wish to take this apart in case you have uh, some grit in there, some dirt that just doesn't want to come out, uh, it is possible to separate the diopter, do a partial disassembly by removing this absolutely tiny staked pin right here. I'm going to drift this out very carefully with a hammer and get this removed. There's your pin, it's roughly 1.5 millimeters. And once I remove the punch, I can now remove the head assembly right here. And there's your drum assembly, along with your guide rod and guide rod spring. Again, not recommended, but you can see in this case, we have a relatively dirty and gritty diopter um, I would say it is justifiable, at least for this particular one. Other than that, I would not attempt any further disassembly of the components. So again, not recommended. The charging handle assembly, for all intents and purposes, is consolidated into a single part. You have the stainless steel cups, which are riveted together via the center stem, and the receiver detent spring here, that keeps it in place in the forward position, riveted in place as well. You have the charging handle rail, a profile steel section, and the charging handle body, which is a drop forging, that are basically brazed together, so there's no real way to actually take this apart. The bolt group consists of the bolt head, which has the ejector and cartridge holder assembly, as well as the roller and roller bearing elements. The bolt carrier itself houses the firing pin, as well as the wedge inserts. Uh, for the bolt assembly, the regular field strip procedure is to separate the bolt head to the bolt body by removing the cross key. But actually, in this case of extensive disassembly, it's actually easier to work on the bolt head with the bolt carrier still on. It gives me something to grab onto. Now to initiate this, I'm going to unhook the ejector spring right here, just like this. And I'm going to lift the rear leg of the spring to clear the stop peg. just like this. Now that the stop peg is free, I could extract it out, and that allows the ejector to move beyond its normal position and to be simply removed like this. Now that the ejector is removed, you can see the roller retaining bar is exposed, so I could tap that out. That one came out easy. And now that the retaining bar is out, out comes the roller and roller bearing assembly on the left side and on the right side. Now again, uh, the sets of rollers are basically interchangeable. You just need to make sure that they're the correct set. In this case, they're both minus size. So you can swap them around. The system self-adjusts, uh, so it's relatively a non-concern. So now that the bolt head is mostly stripped, I can now separate it by pushing the cross key. By moving the bolt head just a bit forward, you have this position where the cross key can actually be removed. 
basically you have a clearance cut right here that allows the cross key to be slid out. Let's move on to the removal of the cartridge holder right here. Removing the cartridge holder uh, requires the bolt head to be clamped in a vise. Now I do remind the Schrodinger 57 does not technically have a true extractor. What you see right here that vaguely resemb resembles one is really just a piece that provides a little bit of static friction to keep the case in place uh, to ready it for ejection. So there's no positive hook, simply a sloped surface to keep the cartridge case in alignment. To remove this, I'm going to use a special rounded bit here to avoid scratching things up. I'm going to wedge this underneath the cartridge holder, give it a firm push, and just pull it right out of its recess on the bolt head. On the bolt head, you have these two domed head pins right here. Technically, you should be able to remove these by punching them out via the disassembly holes right here. Uh, I'm not going to do this for two reasons. One, I do not have a tool to actually put them back in. It requires a special tool with a convex head in order to avoid flattening the tip of these, uh, these pins. And second, the distance between the tip of that dome head and this surface of the bolt head is critical. It's actually under tolerance. I don't want to disturb that fit, so I'm going to leave this alone. Now, obviously, the purpose of these dome head pins is to keep the bearings in place. These have a semicircular indent inside them that allows these to rock in place without actually falling out. The ejector assembly has an outer spring, which is the silver colored McDonald kitty straw kind of deal, and an internal spring inserted inside of the ejector. To remove the outer spring, all it takes is to pop it up, put some tension on with your nail, and then squeeze the legs of the spring, and out it comes. Now, removing the internal spring is not recommended for general cleaning. You can pretty much get to all the crevices without taking it out, but really it's quite easy. You simply push it out this way. You can see it lives kind of in a groove here, like that, and I can just wiggle it out, and there's your inner spring. There's a, another part on the ejector, which is this pin right here. This is not designed to be removed since it is firmly brazed in place. So this is considered one single unit. You can see on the ejector you have the what I call the passive extraction beak. This is basically what serves an, as an extractor when you want to manually withdraw around from the chamber. Uh, normally during the cycle of operation, as I mentioned before, the case extracts itself. Therefore, you do not really necessarily need to make the ejector very strong for extraction, uh, con contrary to other designs such as the AK assault rifle, which do have very strong and positive extractors. This is not the case on the Stuttgart 57, simply because it is not required by virtue of design. To start this assembly of the carrier, I'm going to remove the pivot pin for the firing pin lever, which you see poking out on both sides. I'm just going to push this out with a punch. And next, I'm going to use this special tool right here to remove the firing pin. So once that is in, I can simply pull the firing pin lever out like this. I can ease the tension and out comes your firing pin and firing pin spring. That's really about it for the bolt carrier. Um, another separate part are these tungsten carbide wedge inserts. This is basically what controls how much of the cartridge case impulse, which I remind has already been partially absorbed by the front train, how much of it actually translates to rearwards movement of the carrier. And therefore the angles and wearing surfaces are extremely critical, which kind of justifies why on the Stringer 57 they're armored, so to speak, with extremely hard tungsten carbide inserts. Now these are hard soldered in place after the bolt carrier has been heat treated and then finished ground to the final specification. And that's what gives you the correct bolt carrier. Now in this particular case we're dealing with a rifle that has been privatized, meaning that it shifts from government property and militiaman possession to militiaman property. In that case the rifle is converted to semi-auto only and this is partially done by removing the auto sear command uh, shelf, so to speak, with a single milling operation right here. You can see the slot cut. This means that the auto sear cannot be actuated by the bolt carrier anymore. And even the auto sear itself has been removed from the trigger housing. We're gonna take a look at that later.
That concludes the bolt carrier. Let's continue with the trigger group. You have the pistol grip assembly and of course the various elements responsible for striking the firing pin. And of course the winter trigger, trigger and safety assembly. Let's get right to it. I'm going to start by removing or actually emptying the contents of the pistol grip. For this appropriate punch, slide off the trap door. And out comes usually the clip-on diopter, which has, uh, in this particular case, tritium elements. So that's a second generation uh, clip-on rear sight. And generally one or two blister packs of automaton fits for a concept called combat greasing. Now, you could take apart the, the, the lid, but uh, I would not recommend doing this because it's absolutely impossible to put it back together. Um, basically, there's a roll pin right here with an elbow spring and this flat bent piece of metal right here that holds it in place in the pistol grip. Relatively straightforward. Now to remove the pistol grip, it is held in place with these two slotted screws right here and is secured in place with these uh, nylock safety nuts which are uh, inserted into the pistol grip to keep it in place. So I'm just going to take the appropriate screwdriver and just remove this. Nice and slow. Repeat that with the other screw. Now with the two screws out, the pistol grip just slides right off. You could theoretically remove the nylock safety nuts, but if they're not defective, I would not touch them. You can see that they have this, uh, these grooves on the outside to bite into the plastic and that's what keeps them from over rotating. Other than that, the pistol grip is basically a part, there's not much to it. Let's move on to the vise for the rest of the trigger mechanism. To take the trigger housing apart, I'm going to start by removing all of the ancillary parts, starting with a takedown pin as mentioned before by pressing the push button. I'm going to set this aside. Next is the full auto blocking plate right here. And now I'm going to decock the hammer by easing it down. This is important because if the hammer actually strikes the trigger pack trunnion here, it might actually uh, crack the part. There you go. Now the hammer is eased. You can see here a little sliver of a part. That's the main pen retainer. That's what prevents the pins from walking out in this direction. I'm just going to lift it up out of the way so that it clears the hammer pin. And I'm just going to get it started with a little tap right here. Once this is in place, I can wiggle the hammer pin out. And out it comes. Now I, I need to be very careful. The hammer has a very, very strong hammer spring. So by carefully controlling the hammer, I could remove it and clear it. And out comes the spring guide right here, the hammer spring itself, and your hammer assembly. Let's move on to removing the trigger assembly, which has the trigger blade, which is right here, the trigger body, the sear, the disconnector riveted onto the trigger body itself, and of course, the winter trigger. I'm gonna start by unhooking the trigger spring right here. And then I could start the trigger pin, which is poking out right here. And just wiggle it straight up. Out comes the pin. And I'm keeping my thumb over the sear because it has a tendency to flop out. Out comes your sear, which has been privatized, meaning that the, the nose for the full auto function has been removed. your combined sear and disconnector spring right here. And then I can simply lift out the trigger body and the winter trigger itself. Here's your trigger and trigger body without the full auto sear trip pawl and the winter trigger itself. Now to remove the safety lever, I'm going to start by wedging a piece of paper between the safety detent 
and the trigger housing. This is to avoid marring the edge of the receiver when I push this past the full auto position. So by pushing this out beyond its normal position, you can see that it clears the trigger housing and I can remove it along with the pin retainer that shares an access with the safety lever itself. Now in reality, this part you see right here is not the magazine catch. So unlike different designs like the Stringer 90 and the AK, the paddle or interface with the user's finger does not actually act as a mag catch. The true mag catch is this piece you see right here. When I push the mag catch in, it actually actuates a different part that locks into the magazine rear lug. Now the, the design intent is double. One, it reduces the amount of space required inside the trigger housing, so you can have a very tight and narrow assembly. And another one is that it basically delegates the mag catch to use a stronger interface, this machine steel train here, instead of bearing all of the magazine strain on a fragile sheet metal part that is simply spot welded and brazed onto the trigger housing. So relatively clever construction there. Uh, to remove the mag catch, sorry, the mag catch lever in that case, it is held in place by this interesting double roll pin setup. Uh, the armorer's manual actually states to drive out the inner pin first, but from experience, it never seems to work. It always moves as, as one single unit. So I'm going to drive this out just like any regular pin. So once this is out, I can remove the mag catch lever right here. And you can see that the mag catch lever also retains the true magazine catch, it just popped out. And I can lift it up and remove the mag catch spring, which is extremely stout. I mean, you're talking about several kilograms of preload there. Uh, and that's another advantage of the setup is that it allows an extremely strong and positive magazine catch. And because of the leverage afforded by this uh, actuating lever, you can still get a relatively reasonable uh, tension on your thumb without having to fight this really, really heavy spring there. Now the mag catch itself, which you can see flopping around here, is held in place by this riveted pin right here. I'm not going to remove this uh, because I don't see a need for it. I don't want to disturb that riveted fit. It's really quite straightforward. You have a riveted pin here that goes all the way through the trigger housing trunnion. And then here you have your magazine catch, which simply pivots off of it uh, on the access pin. Now on the magazine, sorry, on the trigger housing itself, you have several added parts. The trunnion, as I mentioned before, is brazed in place. Here you have this leaf spring, which has these two legs. This leg right here is for indexing the winter trigger and the leg on the bottom there is going to be for the second stage. I'm going to take this apart later on. Here is a reinforcing bracket that allows a hammer to strike this part uh, to reinforce this particular area of the trigger housing. Removing the second stage adjustment nut requires the use of a relatively special spanner wrench. This allows me to depress the leg of that leaf spring and by doing so, the nut is cleared from this oblong slot that is cut into the trigger housing and this allows me to actually remove it. Now, in order to facilitate the reinstallation of that nut and to make sure the trigger setting is not significantly changed, I'm going to basically use that edge as a reference so I could put it back roughly in the same spot. So by pressing down, you can see the nut is moving and I can see the flat being exposed and I can simply turn this out with my hand and just relax that right there. Now there is a a little loop and pin that are located on the leg of the leaf spring there, but these are basically uh, permanently riveted in place. There's no real way of removing it except by destroying these two rivets and removing the leaf spring altogether. And I think, uh, let's move on to the individual parts and I can tell you what can be or can't be disassembled. In terms of the individual trigger subcomponents, you got a few. The winter trigger itself has a tube that is uh, brazed into it. This is actually a separate part, you can see the seam right here. So not designed to be taken apart. The hammer has the spring guide that is firmly riveted in place. Again, not designed to be taken apart. And on your trigger, in this case privatized, you have the disconnector right here, riveted in place with this pin. 
and a stop pin that interfaces with the winner trigger in this particular manner. Both of these are riveted in place and cannot be removed. The safety lever is composed of the safety lever arbor, the actual lever extension, the thumb piece, and a little detent right here that is nested between the extension and the thumb piece itself. All of this is consolidated and heavily riveted together, so again, not designed to be taken apart. The takedown pin can be uh, disassembled, however, I would not recommend it and I will not attempt it in this video. Basically, the whole thing that holds it together is this absolutely microscopic roll pin that you see right here. Now, just to show you what goes on inside of it, you basically have a, a spring that is shaped in this particular manner in such a way that you got these two projections and that's what keeps the takedown pin captive. The push button has a, uh, a very carefully machined radius right here or fillet so that when you push this in, you can see that it cams the ears of the spring right in. Now what actually defines the limit of travel for the push button and what keeps everything together, as I mentioned before, is that single roll pin. So theoretically, you would simply need to dry this out and then simply separate all the various assemblies. Generally, these are relatively trouble-free, so um, I think there's no need to disassemble the one we have today. The stock group itself consists of the rear receiver section and internal stock tube, the stock itself with the sling, and of course, the massive recoil spring assembly. Let's get right to it. We can even start by removing the sling. Undo the rivet right here. Push the sling through the sling loop, or sling hole in that case. Remove the buckle. And slide the sling right out. Next, I'm going to remove the stock set screw right here. This is basically what radially controls the stock, otherwise it is fully guided by the stock tube. I'm going to use the slotted screwdriver bit. Remove that right here. And then I can start unscrewing the stock. This right here is an early stock tube. Uh, the later ones, roughly done in the 70s, were hard chromed. Uh, they had some pretty serious corrosion issues with these. So make sure that you periodically check and generously grease the stock tube to avoid any moisture from actually damaging the steel. The stock itself uh, does not have much to assemble. You have some integrally molded pieces, including this aluminum bushing right here and a cast aluminum guide tube on the inside. These are all molded inside, so unless you want to cut the stock open, there's not much to be done here. In terms of the stock tube and receiver rear section, there are two riveted assemblies that I'm not going to take apart. This right here is the rubber buffer. You can see it peeking through right here. Basically, by interacting with the buffer lug on the bolt carrier, it basically cushions the impact of the bolt uh, generally when the bolt velocity is a little bit higher than average. It's not guaranteed to do that. In this case, all you need to do is drive out that riveted pin right here and simply push it out. Here's the buffer outside of the rear receiver section and the corresponding riveting pin. The stock catch is again installed with a riveted pin. You have a flat V spring right here which powers it. And the catch is simply this deep drawn piece right here. I think that's pretty much it for the stock group. Now on the recoil spring, the only thing that really can be taken apart is the outer spring assembly, which is kept in place with a washer and a keeper. To do this, you want to arm the spring with your bare hands and, and then remove the washer and the keeper like this. Now be very careful, that spring is a 12 kilogram spring, so you want to make sure you ease that nice and easy so it doesn't squirt out too badly. And you can then slide off the outer recoil spring, which is long, check this out. And then the outer spring should just slide off 
like this. So you may have noticed that we're left with this inner spring assembly, which basically has a telescoping two-piece guide tube, a flange and a rod for the outer spring, and very mysterious, an anti-bounce head assembly. Basically, this thing, during bolt carrier closure, kind of acts like a dead blow hammer in order to dampen the amount of uh, bolt bounce amplitude to make sure it falls within a safe range. Now, to actually remove this uh, is actually prohibited. You're not actually allowed to take this apart, but I still did it for science. The anti-bounce head assembly is this kind of uh, gizmo right here. It's, uh, it's quite intriguing. Basically speaking, on the inside you have an extremely strong spring uh, that is installed on a spike which can move forward and backwards and secured in place with a nut. Let's take a look at it uh, completely disassembled. So right here you have the anti-bounce uh, assembly body which is this conical piece right here. To keep this from loosening uh, they had to resort to using nylon inserts to make sure that thing stays in place. I don't know if this actually shows on camera, but you can see these little round halos. Let's see if it focuses. Basically, these are nylon inserts, four of these, inserted into blind holes. And uh, by threading this into the inner tube assembly, the nylon inserts deform, and that's what gives it the friction to keep it in place. Now what's interesting as well is that this is a custom thread. This, this is a thread that does not exist in standard thread charts. I think it's an M11.7 thread or some other weird stuff like that. So this thing is definitely a nightmare to manufacture and design. Now just to show you the spike, basically this is what interfaces with the tail of the bolt carrier like this. And the amount of gap that you see right here is basically how much the entire recoil spring assembly moves to counter that bolt bounce. There's your anti-bounce spring and oh, I can barely deform this with the pressure of my fingers. This thing is insanely strong. And another thing that really shows the extravagance of the design is how the spring, it's, uh, sorry, the spike itself is secured. Because when you imagine, if I insert the spring like this and the body together, you know, what's actually preventing it from being squirted forward? And here's the secret, they use both an ellipsoidal or elliptical offset nut, which is really exotic, and the tiniest of nylon inserts right here, uh, this nylon insert right here, which goes through a, a through hole on the threaded area. So this thing is double secured. Now basically an, an elliptoid offset nut is just a standard round nut that has been squished into this elliptical shape, and this causes the thread to kind of deform. And once the part is hardened, uh, basically becoming elastic, and is threaded onto uh, the appropriate connector, the threads elastically deform, which gives this kind of this pinching effect. So you can see that uh, the SIG engineers definitely did not want this to come out or come apart uh, at any point of the rifle service life, or to be fair, the, the recoil spring service life. Really absolutely crazy stuff. Now, just to show you the, the guide tube assembly, as soon as you remove the anti-bounce head, the guide rod for the outer spring, which actually goes through like this, projects like this, can actually come out the front. And the two-piece telescopic assembly is actually uh, swaged in place. There's no real way to separate this unless you remove this flange right here, which is soldered onto the telescopic guide assembly. Now, another thing I want to mention as well is the outer spring tube has a flange again right here inside that is actually being crimped in place. So this thing is an absolute nightmare. The recoil spring assembly on the Schrodinger 57 is one of these oddly complicated assemblies along with the diopter. I gotta say this thing is, is an absolute nightmare, which probably explains why you would outright replace the whole thing instead of having to try and work on these specific features. So that's about it for the recoil spring really. Now for the jacket assembly. The jacket assembly is composed of the handguard, the bipod sub-assembly right here, as well as the front sight block with bayonet lug, and the front sight carrier. Let's start by removing the handguard here. It is held on with the same screw as the main retention screw. So I'm just going to remove it in the correct bit. Once it is out, 
persuade it with a little punch here. Out comes your handguard screw. Now, this is very important. Uh, there's some people that improperly disassemble these. The handguard was never designed to be butterflied open. The, the issue is that you're creating a, a stress fracture in this particular cutout for the carry handle. The handguard was really only designed to be open this much for reassembly. So it's supposed to come out from the rear, not actually to be butterflied and removed from the top. If you do that, uh, you risk splitting your handguard in half outright. Now this is less prevalent on the later handguards, which are made out of, I believe, different material. But uh, if you want to preserve your handguard, just uh, don't stress it too much. It's only designed to open roughly 15 to 20 millimeters for disassembly. To disassemble the front sight tower and the front sight assembly, I'm going to use a special armorer's tool that was developed in the late 70s in order to help replace the expired illuminating elements. Uh, the, well, this tool is basically a, an analog computer that memorizes the position of your sight so you don't actually have to you know, move it around and re-zero the rifle. It's a pretty clever design. Now to start off, I'm just going to set the tool up to receive the front sight assembly. Make sure everything's nice and loose. I'm going to come from underneath. Just clamp it in place. Now what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to move the micrometer nut in such a way that it barely contacts the edge of that sight. And this is basically what defines the position. This conical nut that you see right here is just there to keep the sight in place while I drift uh, that roll pin out. So make sure everything is nice and tight. And I'm going to take my special roll pin punch and drift out the front side roll pin. Now you can see the tool is really well designed. You have a through hole right here which allows the pin to drop through very safely and you don't lose anything. It's, it's really fantastic design. Now once you do that you notice that your front side is basically mounted on a split dovetail which means the dovetail kind of pinches the side in place with elastic effect. Now if you do not have this tool you'll have to drift it out with a brass punch. However, this is the genius part of the tool. By turning this knob, what it does is that it compresses the dovetail so you can easily remove the sight just like this. So here I'm compressing the dovetail and when I loosen the conical nut, the sight should just come out like butter. There's your front sight. Now of course, uh, I should not touch the micrometer nut because this is what's defining the position of my sight. So I'm just going to leave this alone, loosen everything back up, and just remove the tool from the front sight carrier, just like this. So now everything is nice, everything's fantastic. Now I'm going to remove the front sight tower. It is held in place relatively similarly. Basically there's a heavy roll pin right here, and there's an extremely strong spring detent assembly in there. Let me take my bench block. So I'm going to start by drifting this pin out. It takes a few couple of good pounds. There you go. Now the roll pin has been removed. You can see the relatively interesting slotted construction of the roll pin. These were developed by a company called Konex AG and I believe they still make this spec to this day, but it's, it's really a clever design because it allows relatively standard tolerances of holes, yet it guarantees you a very good fit and self-centering, so to speak. Uh, pretty cool design. Now that the punch is fully in, I can withdraw it from the sight base, and out comes, should give it a little wiggle, there you go. There's your sight carrier right here with the detent that is nested inside. Now to remove the detent, it's going to take a few taps. This one's a bit, a bit gritty, but uh, I'm sure we'll fix that in short notice. You can see there's your detent spring and the detent itself. Now there's another part that probably does not need to be regularly removed, but still requires a bit of mention, is this part that you see peeking through the split of the uh, the dovetail called the Schutzhülse or the protecting cup, so to speak. It's basically a drawn aluminum cup 
that fits into the hole and it closes off. So in case you have rain or you know mud or dirt, it doesn't actually contaminate the inside of the detent. Uh, pretty clever design. Now to remove that requires a pretty thin feeler gauge. I can take one that's what's aimed for 0.55. That should do the trick. So I'm just going to coax it out initially like this, like that, and just push it out all the way through nice and gently. It's a pretty fragile part. So I'm gonna make sure you treat it with a bit of respect. Once it is out, I can just bias it out. And there it is. You can see it's pretty caked on, but uh, this, uh, this right here is the Schutzhülse, very important part. And now everything can be cleaned uh, properly. So to remove the bipod assembly, it's really quite straightforward. You have a, a screw that has, again, the same nylock safety nuts that we all know. In order to remove that, it is good practice to just hold it in place with a wrench to avoid the edges of the nut gouging into the aluminum bipod. And I'm just going to remove that screw the standard way. Nut is out, I can now push the screw out of the way. There we go. That allows me to simply slide out the rightmost bipod leg. And I'm gonna do the same for the other side. Same thing. There we go, screws out. And then once I remove the bipod, I can now remove a very critical part called the bipod stirrup, which is basically what bears the entire weight of the bipod. Uh, this thing's a profiled steel section that is finished machined. Now you can see that the bipod bracket, which is this part right here, basically stays on the jacket and cannot come off easily. Now, if this is, this is indeed defective, uh, a standard armor practice allegedly was to make a pair of levers with slots that you can simply stick through that and then you'd basically open it up and try to remove it from the rear. Now in reality, this thing is assembled before the jacket connector is actually riveted on. So it's not actually intended to be bent this way. Now, the jacket assembly has a couple of riveted assemblies. You have a rear bipod catch and the front bipod catch, which are basically C-shaped springs that are riveted opposite to the catch with a pop rivet. So basically a blind pop rivet right here. So if you do want to replace the catches, you would have to drill the rivets out and simply remove the defective catch. The front side block and bayonet lug is one integral forging finish machine, and this whole thing is swaged onto the jacket with a barrel bushing right here as kind of a counter nut, so to speak. So this entire thing is basically consolidated together in one single part, and that about wraps it up for the jacket assembly. The bipod has a spring catch, which is nested inside of this bolt right here. To remove this, uh, what I would do is to actually arm the spring, or to take a bit of tension off of it, using a punch and the bipod stirrup itself. Just like this. And I'm going to jig this up so I can drive this roll pin right out. Once the roll pin is out, I can now slowly relax the spring tension and normally the detention come right out. So here you have the detent itself and the spring, which unfortunately has a bit of corrosion. So it's a good thing that we took this apart. Generally, these are not greased, which is a bit of a problem since the bipod is exposed to the elements. I'm going to do the same for the other bipod leg. Whoa. 
this one is really heavily rusted. Damn, okay, this is gonna take a little bit of cleaning and uh, elbow grease. So remember, check your detents from time to time and grease them generously once you reassemble these. Now, small detail, which you know really makes a difference on this rifle. Uh, this right here is a little feet insert. It's basically a hammer dry screw that is pushed in, and these are made out of special hardened steel, so you don't actually wear the bipod flat uh, during the service life of the rifle. Uh, I've never seen replacement parts for these. I guess theoretically you could remove and replace these, uh, but realistically, uh, I guess they're just kind of semi-permanently uh, left in place. The 24 round extruded aluminum standard box magazine is composed of the magazine body with the riveted on lugs as well as a follower, magazine spring, and magazine floor plate. Taking apart the magazine requires the removal of the base plate first. It's kind of a borrowed design from the LMG25 where the base plate itself kind of grabs onto the magazine body. It doesn't ride in a tongue and groove joint. Now to do that you need a relatively stiff and non-marring tool. If you do that with a screwdriver you're gonna have some beautiful artwork on that part of the magazine. So the idea is to just depress the tab inwards while at the same time pushing the base plate so I can clear that slot right here. It may take a few tries. There we go. You can see I pop that right in there while putting pressure and now I could exaggeratedly tilt the base plate so that that tab right here is clear, just like this. And now out comes your mag spring, and then your follower. Now in this case, we have an injection molded plastic follower. This was introduced roughly after 1962. The mag shell itself is the later reinforced variant with the thicker feed lips, as well as the simplified and reinforced lug construction. This probably is the more common variant that you can find on the open market right now. The six round rifle grenade launching magazine consists of a magazine body with lugs that are spot welded on, as well as the follower and spring assembly and the bolt locking mechanism. Let's get right to it. Rifle grenade magazine is pretty easy to take apart because the only thing you realistically need to remove on this is the follower and spring. To do this, I'm going to depress the rear of the follower like this. This allows me to reach in there and grab that first coil of the spring. I can simply remove it this way. Now the rest, uh, which include the catch right here, this little gripping bar, and the lugs is all welded, riveted, consolidated in place, including that filler piece right here. So I would definitely not recommend taking this apart. Uh, unless, of course, you're crazy like me and actually attempted this. Here is a completely disassembled rifle grenade magazine just to allow you to appreciate the internal mechanics of this. So this right here is the main actuating piece which has a button. It's basically powered by the follower spring. And you can see this is the toggle that locks the bolt in place uh, when that button is depressed. So it locks the bolt during rifle grenade firing and you can see the way it just fits in there and I could wiggle this around. Now there are other sort of assortments. You have of course a bushing or a roller with a bracket. This gives you enough space inside for the spring to act on. A nylon gripping bar right here and an extruded aluminum uh, filler piece which in this case also acts like a guide for that toggle right here. Basically fits in this area of the magazine and is firmly riveted in place. You get these four aluminum rivets. Now you can see the way the mag is constructed, you have a much shorter feet path, which means that in theory, it should prevent you from actually loading this with a GP11, which would be highly undesirable uh, when you fire rifle grenades. Since the rifle grenade cartridge has a much shorter overall length, this magazine should in theory guarantee your safety. The model 1957 bayonet consists of the bayonet assembly, which has the blade, cross guard, grip, and pommel assembly with the retention catch as well as the sheath assembly, which has the frog attached to it. Let's start taking this apart. Take apart the bayonet. Let's start with the blade assembly. Now the blade assembly has a retention catch mechanism that is held in place by this plastic cover. 
and you can see you got two machine screws to remove right here so I'm going to proceed to that. Once I remove both screws, the plastic cover comes off and you can see the spring that is kind of captured in the plastic cover, which I can remove simply by tugging on it. When the plastic cover is removed, I can now remove the locking roller right here. And normally that's where armor maintenance ends. However, if you do wish to go further, it is possible to unscrew the pommel. To remove the pommel, just use a good punch and just unscrew that right off. Out comes your pommel. Next, and make sure you have something to catch underneath in case the blade falls out, I'm going to simply tap out the blade, which is simply friction fit into the handle itself. Once I feel it's loose enough, I can simply wiggle it off. There we go. The handle comes right off. You can see the cross guard just slides right off the blade assembly. Be careful, make sure you don't cut or stab yourself. I'm going to start this disassembly the sheath by removing the bayonet frog. This right here it seems to be an M55 variant. Pretty common. To remove the, the mouthpiece, which contains the spring for the blade, there's a single screw right here that simply needs to be removed. Once that is out, in theory, the mouthpiece should come straight out. If it refuses to come out, it sometimes helps to pry this very, very gently just to get it moving. And now comes your mouthpiece. The sheath itself comes in several variations. Some have the mold alignment hole, some don't. Uh, in this case, it kind of helps with cleaning, so I can just run water through it, make sure that the inside is nice and clean. We're not gonna be taking the optic apart for obvious reasons, or not even separated from the mount. However, there is something to be taken apart, discussed, and maintained. It's going to be the detent and catch assembly, and the centering screw as well. You need to understand how this works. Basically, there's a centering screw which pushes into a special divot in the sight base. Uh, the centering screw is retained in place by this tooth detent right here. Now note, this is not a ratchet. Please do not force the knob if it doesn't want to turn. This is because the detent right here is supposed to keep it in place. If you can actually turn this like a ratchet, that means you have already unfortunately worn the tooth on the actual detent. So to take this out, just press and just unscrew until the centering screw comes right out. And once this is out, you can remove your detent. Comes right out. Now, as you can see, as I mentioned before, there's your tooth right here. There's not a whole lot of material. And it basically engages with these notches on the centering screw. So you can intuitively understand that if you force this too much, uh, you're going to wear it smooth. You want to drop in the spring into the cavity here. Make sure that the detent is facing the correct orientation, basically in line with the centering screw. And now, press in and just turn that until you obtain the satisfactory position. You're going to hear the click, now it's locked in place. You're going to reinstall the mouthpiece. Make sure this holds a line and reinstall the screw. Nice and neat. I'll reinstall the blade. I want to make sure the orientation is correct. 
WF logo facing up, a chamfer right here facing towards the blade. Next I'm going to reinstall the grip with the subcontractor logo facing up again. I'm just going to get this started and tap it on. Just like this. Next, reinstall the pommel. Make sure it's reinstalled in the right orientation. There we go. Once the holes are aligned, I just need to check. Yep, everything seems to be in the correct orientation. I'm going to drop the locking roller. The screw doesn't want to interfere with the locking roller back in place. Now, just on the cover, the spring has a swelled end. You want to make sure the swelled end goes in first. That's what keeps it in place. Just like that. I can reinstall the cover. I'm going to do the counter sunk head screw first. Excellent. I'm going to reinstall it back in the sheet. Now the bayonet is reassembled. Let's reinstall the follower spring. Just gonna insert the fork end in there. Arm is in place. Now I'm going to hook turn the spring into the follower in this fashion. Slide the whole thing right in. And then insert the follower at an angle in such a way that I hook that front shelf right here into that slot. Now to complete the reassembly process, you basically have to insert a long tool, could be the sheath of the bayonet for example, and just shove that in so it clicks in place. Now the magazine is reassembled. Reinstall the follower and the spring in the rifle grade magazine body. Insert the spring. And just reinstall it in reverse. Test for function. I'm going to reinstall the detents on the bipod. For this, I'm going to generously grease the inside of the hole and the detents themselves. This is to avoid any corrosion. Once we're done, I'm going to start by inserting the detent with a spring. And very important, I want to make sure that the cutout is facing the hole. Uh, there is a risk that you insert this upside down and you end up absolutely crushing your roll pin. But it's worth double checking. So once that is inserted in place, I'm going to arm the spring with the usual technique of using the stirrup and punch. I want to make sure the hole is clear. Yep. And we can reinstall this the old fashioned way. I want to be very careful not to mar the aluminum there uh, because it has a quite a delicate finish. So I want to make sure that I seat the pin nice and securely. There we go. Now the catch has been reinstalled. I'm going to repeat that for the other bipod blade. Now the two bipod legs are done, I can reinstall them back on the barrel jacket. By placing the stirrup in the correct position, you can see that in order to determine which way, it doesn't really matter, but in this case for attention to detail, you can see that this side is clearly worn more than the other. So I could deduce that this one is going to face the muzzle since most of the time the bipod is used in the middle or rifle position. I'm going to reinstall the correct bipod leg. I'm going to start with the right, uh, left one in this case. And then simply insert the screw by pressing in on the bipod. And I reinstalled the nylock nut.
And just so I don't have to use the wrench, I'm just going to push this. So the nut is retained here, and I'm going to finish off with the screwdriver. Now that it is reinstalled, I can test it out, and I'll repeat the same for the other bipod leg. Go. Same thing, reinstall the 9 off nut and finish off the job with a screwdriver. Just going to test the bipod real quick. Nice position, left, right leg correct. We're going to test the detents. Forward position press, slide. Front detent works fine. First, I'm going to reinsert that little jacket sleeve using a large punch. So I don't crush it. There we go, nice and snug. And then I'm going to very generously grease the front side detent just to make sure it doesn't corrode or trap any moisture. I'll do the same for that detent nub right here. Once that is in place. I'm going to reinstall it on the front side block using a slave pin and then drive the special roll pin through. So I'm going to align this and then with a swift movement. There you go, slave pin is in place. And I'll start reinstalling the roll pin. Gonna make sure that it's equalized on both sides. Excellent. Now to reinstall the front side, I wanna make sure that the dovetail surfaces are perfectly clean. This is important to make sure that it's repeatable. And I'm gonna use my favorite analog computer. Installing it here. I'm going to pinch the dovetail in such a way that I can reinstall the front side easily. Insert the conical nut, make sure it's nice and tight and aligned. Release the dovetail. And now I can reinstall the front side roll pin. Now the armor manual states that the slot of the roll pin should be facing up. This is to allow a good distribution of tension around the dovetail. And the roll pin is successfully reinstalled. Undo the conical nut. And simply remove the front side. I just want to check that the hash marks are indeed aligned. This is the case, which means that theoretically the rifle does not need to be re-zeroed. Action is smooth, nice and crisp. Front sight locks in relatively perpendicular. This one is a little bit worn, but that's no big deal. Let's reinstall the handguard. Again, as a reminder, make sure that you do not excessively butterfly the handguard and insert it from the rear. When the handguard is in place, I can reinstall the handguard screw right here. Handguard is on, jacket assembly is complete. Reinstalling the spring requires putting the outer spring back on the outer tube. Now note that one side of the spring actually has a coil that is drawn in for retention. You want to make sure they use the right coil. I'm just going to slide this back into the outer spring. There we go. And next comes the more sporty aspect of it. Might take a few attempts, but the idea is to slide the outer tube back on while keeping the guide rod in the forward position and then compress the spring with your hands and then reinstall the respective keepers. Let's try one attempt.
There we go. That was pretty easy. To reinstall the stock, simply insert the stock tube into the stock body and you can see the bushing taking effect until you reach a snug position. Just like that. You want to make sure that everything is nice and vertical so you can insert the set screw without any issues. There we go, nice and snug. Then we are going to reinstall the recoil spring assembly. And then the actual sling. Pass it through the stock hole. Insert it through the buckle, up and around, all the way out, through the slot again. And now reinstall your rivet. There we go. This completes the assembly of the stock group. I'm going to reinstall my second stage adjustment nut. And compress the spring down to the position I roughly memorized before. Just simply reinstall the nut on that little stud that is barely protruding right here. There we go. We'll refine the trigger adjustment later when we reassemble the entire trigger assembly. To reinstall the magazine catch, I'm going to put the spring back into its spring seat in the, in the trigger housing trunnion. Just like this. Now it's in place. And then using the punch as a slave pin, I'm going to reinstall the mag catch lever. Just like this. There we go. Now the roll pin is nice and flush on both sides and that catch is reassembled. I'm going to reinstall the safety lever assembly along with the pin retainer. I'm going to put this through the trigger housing and make sure I put the pin retainer onto the axis pin right here. Now once this is in place, in order to avoid marring the side of the receiver, I'm going to insert the same piece of paper as I did during this assembly. There you go. Now you can see the safety is reinstalled. You can test it. We're going to reinstall the trigger and the winner trigger assembly. You want to make sure that your disconnector is all the way forward in the correct position and reinstall the trigger in such a way that the winner trigger stop pin slips in front of this leg of the leaf spring that you see right here. It's a little bit of a two-handed or actually three-handed job in this case. There we go. Took a few tries, but we're now in place. Now a neat little trick is to use the hammer spring guide as a slave pin. And once that is in place, I can now reinstall the sear spring on the spring post. Just like this, so it stays vertical. And now I can reinstall the sear. Maintaining pressure on the sear, I'm going to push the slave pin through. Now you can see that everything's nice and aligned. I'm going to reinsert the trigger axis pin using the slave pin as a guide. And then just wiggle around the entire trigger group until you can see right here 
the trigger pin has protruded all the way through. I'm just gonna seat it a bit with the screwdriver handle. Now you can see when the trigger works just fine. Now I'm just gonna push that trigger forward and apply the safety so it's easier for me to reinstall the trigger spring. With a good pair of pliers, I'm gonna hook this on the hook. You can see right here on the bottom of the receiver housing floor, sorry, the trigger housing floor. Just hook that right onto the trigger body right here. Now you can see the spring has a bit of twang, which is a bit annoying because when you fire, you're gonna hear that twang every single time. So I'm just gonna grease that very generously to dampen a little bit that excessive sound. There you go. Now everything's in place. Next, the hammer. Uh, this one takes a little bit of muscle since you don't want the hammer flying off. I'm going to reinstall the hammer spring oops, onto the hammer guide rod. And there's a rear guide rod right here. And I'm going to seat this. Basically, you can see peering through here, there's a little window where I'm sticking my punch through. You want to align that with that conical tip of the spring guide. And at the same time, make sure you shove it all the way to the rear so you compress the spring and put the hammer in place. Now you cannot really see on the other side, but what I'm going to do is reinsert the hammer pin. Then make sure I muscle it around a bit. So there you go. Now you can see the pin is fully protruded. I'm going to seat both pins again so that the retainer can slide on easily and I can put the retainer back in place. I'm going to test the trigger. It's actually pretty nice. The adjustment seems to have held, which is a good thing. Pretty straightforward. I'm going to reinsert it back onto the trigger housing and then start two screws just to keep it in place. And then using a screwdriver, just fasten them back in. Now that the screws are snug, I'm just going to test the trigger again. Yep, mostly fine. Now we're going to reinstall the contents of the pistol grip cavity here. There you go, trigger housing is done, minus the full auto blocking plate. And of course, our famous takedown pin. I'm going to reinstall the firing pin. In this case, it just involves dropping in the firing pin spring. Firing pin alone. And using the special tool, compressing the spring. And then dropping in the firing pin lever. To facilitate the insertion of the pivot pin, I just want to make sure these are mostly flush. Just reinstall that right back in. Firing pin works fine. I'm going to reinstall the cartridge holder. In this case, I can just place this, set this in this way, and use a mallet to set it in place. You can see now, cartridge holder nice and installed. To reinstall the roller sets, I'm going to put the bolt head onto the carrier. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to set the bearing just onto that little pin that we were talking about, and then reinsert the roller just like this. And I'm going to repeat that on the left side. Bearing in, roller in. Now that both sets of rollers are in place, I can now drop back in the roller retaining bar. Just plops down like this. And next, I'm going to reassemble the ejector assembly. So first, I'm going to start with the inner spring. You want to make sure that the cutout of the inner spring faces up uh, in relation to the ejector. So I'm just going to reinstall it like this. I'm going to push the spring back into alignment. Just like this. So right now, you can see the spring is partially reinstalled and then swing it into position and minutely adjusting with the punch and then I could finally pull that leg down and then 
we install it back into the notch just like that now this one is sticking out just a little bit I'm going to just adjust that real quick now you can see that the spring is nice and equal on both sides For the outer spring very simple just align it with that peg squeeze the legs and just reinstall back to our bolt the ejector goes back into its main hole could swing this to its normal position and reinstall the stop peg this particular manner and by biasing the spring up this allows me to reinstall that rear leg of the spring a bit easier I'm going to lift this up and place this near the hole just give it a little push there you go now you can see the leg of the spring is back inside the stop peg I'm going to swing the ejector to the left and then replace the ejector spring back into its place. I can do the function check on the extractor side you can see the inner spring doing its job and on the ejection side the outer spring performing its function and then I finish this off by inserting the bolt head cross key and now your bolt assembly is complete. Make sure that everything is retained and in place. We have good firing pin protrusion cartridge holder is in place, nice and flush, ejector is functional, bolt group is done. Now for the challenging part I'm going to be assembling the diopter together so you can see that I cleaned up very very nicely the numbers are nice and crisp again which is pretty heartwarming to see I thought the paint would never see the light of day. Now first of all what's important is to make sure that the drum is screwed on correctly you kind of have a 50-50 chance of making sure this is correct so depending on where you start in the thread, hopefully you end up in the correct position. Now you can see that at the one position, up to 640, I'm not getting any gaps, therefore the drum is in the correct position. If you turn to 640 and realize that you have a millimeter gap here, your drum is not properly reinstalled. Now for the tricky part, uh, I'm going to be reinstalling the guide rod and spring assembly and at the same time aligning it with the head and then putting that pin right back in. So I'm using a punch just to make sure that head stem or guide rod sticks through. Then I'm going to reinstall my head assembly and make sure that it's nice and aligned. And hopefully, if I get my correct punch, we have reached there we go. The diopter is partially reassembled. I'm just going to do a, a quick check. Both hash marks are facing the correct way, which is the shooter's face. 1 to 640 works fine, no gaps, and you can see the wear marks concord, so that means we reinstalled this correctly. Now all I need to do is to reinstall the pin in such a way that the staking marks align, at least to the best of my abilities. If you reinstall the pin in another orientation, you're going to notice that the staking marks are not fully uh, con congruent, which makes it look kind of cheap, so I'm going to try my best to uh, realign this properly. Unfortunately, I'm going to do this off camera. So as you can see, I've taken the time to align the staking mark. I don't know if that even can be captured on camera upwards, which is where the original staking mark would be. And now I can reinstall the pin basically in reverse. And now you can see that Thanks to the very careful preparation of the pin prior to reassembly, the staking marks basically align. Nobody could ever tell that we ever took this apart. This is our little secret. Now that the diopter is properly reassembled, I can reinstall the aperture insert from the rear of the diopter. Just going to get it started and then use screwdriver to reinstall it back into position. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the diopter is completely reassembled and perfectly clean. Very satisfying. 
I'm going to prepare the reinstallation of the diopter by generously greasing the bores for that detent spring and on both sides of the diopter base. I'm going to clean up the excess later. I'm going to reinstall one side of the cup into that bottom hole there and then finish that off with the other cup. There you go, now it's in place. To reinstall the diopter, I'm going to fit this onto the base and I'm going to give it a nice sharp whack on top just to seat it down onto the receiver. There you go, now it's in place. I'm just going to check that the hole is clear. Perfect, and I can drive the diopter roll pin back into alignment. Perfect. Once this is installed, I can put back my catch assembly. So don't forget, the drum needs to be at 640 meters for this to work. I'm going to reinstall the catch and the catch spring, just like this, and just kind of wedge it between the drum and that recess, and that spring goes right in, just like this. You can see I'm keeping my finger pressure on it, and I'm just going to pull that diopter back down to 100 meters, and you can see that it is stopping at 100 and stopping at 640, which means that the diopter has been correctly reinstalled. This is very important. Prepare the snap ring onto the special tool. And just put it back on the arbor to close or retain, that's a better term, that catch right in place. I'm just going to deform that snap ring back into shape. And now you can see that it has been cleanly reinstalled. The catch is functioning. The diopter snaps smoothly and firmly in both positions. Gross elevation adjustment works. I'm also going to test the fine elevation drum. Yep, also works fine. Diopter is reinstalled. I'm going to reinstall the loader chamber indicator leaf spring. So the idea is to reinstall it in such a way that the fourth end fits back into the loader chamber indicator. It's a bit hard to show on camera, but it takes a few tries to make sure that this is correctly aligned in place. There we go. After 6,000 tries, it is in place. Now it's important for me to maintain pressure on that spring with my pinky finger in order to keep it aligned with the countersunk hole. I'm just going to reinstall the loaded chamber indicator screw. Nice and snug, nice and flush. I'm going to test it out real quick. You can see it's sticking out when I press on the leaf spring. Everything is fine. Let's reinstall the mortises. Now recall this tiny little precision ball bearing that keeps the index in place. Now to ease the reassembly, I'm going to put a little bit of dab of grease in that little recess there just to keep it in place. You can see here it's nicely stuck, so therefore I can reach in to the rifle. And put that, pull that mortise right through the front trunnion. Took a few tries. While maintaining pressure, I'm going to reinstall the circlip right here. You can see the mortise is now in place. I'm going to repeat the same thing for the other side.
There we go. All the circ clips are now in place. See the, the mortises are firmly in place with a bit of play. And I'm going to wrap this up by reinstalling the rifle grenade tension spring, which simply pushes onto the groove in this particular fashion. Phew, so after hours of disassembly, finally, I can safely declare that all the parts that you see here are clean and preserved. Now we can execute the reassembly. We're gonna start with the trigger housing. Pin out. Placing my thumb here to control it. Reinstall back onto the receiver. Push it in place. That's reassembled. Next, I'm going to take the barrel jacket and reinstall it onto the barrel receiver. I'm going to slide it on the barrel, nice and easy. And then reinstall the handguard screw. Snug, just to make sure that there's no play in the barrel jacket. Now I'm gonna reinstall my charging handle, drop it back into these two cutouts onto the receiver and return it forward. To reinstall the bolt correctly, I wanna make sure that I align it with the receiver and then push the ejector to one side just to get it started. Using now the tip of the recoil spring, I'm going to push the bolt home and then simultaneously twist. Now the rifle is reassembled. Let's perform a function check after we have installed the slide. Sorry, the sling in this case. Test the trigger reset. I'm going to test the bolt gap, a very important dimension. The tolerance for the bolt gap is between 1 to 0 0.5 millimeters, or actually 1.1 to 0 0.5 millimeters, to make sure that it is well within spec. Bolt gap is correct. Ladies and gentlemen, the detail strip and cleaning of the Strymgur 57 is complete. So after countless hours of cursing, scrubbing, oiling, greasing, and more grease. I'm completely filthy right now, at least I have a dark shirt on. But, uh, <laughs> it's been an interesting ride. Well, I apologize if sometimes my hand was covering the action. It's, it's a little bit difficult to drift pins out with a camera basically right over the action. So I do apologize for that. But other than that, I would say we're pretty satisfied with the results. More than satisfied. Uh, I mean, this thing is pretty much good for a museum there. There was so much dirt in there. There's a lot of crap in there, uh, especially in that receiver area. It was completely gunked up. And uh, not to mention the rust and the detents there. I think it's a good thing we took these apart and checked. Yeah, otherwise, uh, it would have rotten from the inside out. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, uh, it took a long time to produce, I can definitely tell you that. <laughs> if you have any uh, questions or comments or feedback, just drop them in the comments below. And thanks to Will for lending us his fantastic rifle to play around today. It's been uh, one heck of a roller coaster ride. See you in the next video. Thank you for watching.